What on earth is the difference between eights on pylons and turns around a point? M Zuri Nation, what is happening? Jason Shepard here. Welcome to the Commercial Pilot Podcast, brought to you by our number one rated online ground school. Check it out. Two weeks free. M0Atrial.com. You will not be disappointed. Uh, I think you're going to absolutely love it. In the meantime, too, you're, I know you're loving these free videos. You think the free videos, the free podcasts we put out are good? Imagine how good that paid content is. M0Atrial.com. And if you're just liking the free content, do throw us a thumbs up, a subscribe here uh, as well uh, on Apple, iTunes, Audible, a like on Facebook uh, as well as on YouTube. A subscribe there it means the world to us. You know, we often get confused uh, working towards commercial pilot on this notion of how are eights on pylons any different, Jason, than turns around a point. In fact, look through the commercial pilot ACS, turns around a point, don't even make it on the commercial pilot ACS. Eights on pylons serve as really our main ground reference maneuver. Actually, in the commercial pilot ACS, as compared to the private pilot, Private Pilot has a section for ground reference maneuvers, a section for performance maneuvers. In the Commercial Pilot ACS, the category is just called ground reference and performance maneuvers. Because really, it's eights on pylons is your main ground reference maneuver you're going to be doing. And how do they differ? Well, they actually are, are vastly different. In a turn around a point, what are we trying to accomplish? As a private pilot, if you remember, and I'm sure it was a long time ago for some of you, right, myself included, but if you remember back to turns around a point, we are compensating or practicing to compensate for wind drift as we work our way around. We're practicing how to compensate for wind drift to maintain the same distance all the way around the point. So we're increasing our bank when the wind's blowing us away, we're decreasing our bank when the wind's blowing us towards our point, and that's how we're working our way around this, hopefully you picked a good point, and turns around a point. Some of your aircraft are super easy. Low-wing aircraft, I love doing turns around a point on because you can just kind of flop that wing down on that point and hold it all the way around. High-wing aircraft is a little steep usually to put it, depending on the distance you are from your point. Um, if you can do that in a high-wing aircraft, you're probably a little too far away from your point. Um, but that's a great tactic. And to the Mike Zulu, I'd put it like kind of midway up the strut and just hold it all the way around there. And it would work out great. But then for commercial pilot, I had the most difficult time understanding the difference to eights on pylons. Because with eights on pylons, there is this key buzzword called pivotal altitude. And I didn't get it. Basically, how it was explained to me is, oh, well, with turns around a point, Jason, you use, you know, bank to maintain the same distance all the way around your point. In eights on pylons, you use altitude. And my CFI told me that, I said, what on earth are you talking about? What do you mean you use altitude to maintain the same distance all the way around the point? And then they explained it to me. Do you remember when you were a kid? Did you ever have that airplane on a string? Like you've got the handle in your hand, the airplane's on a string, and you know what, you, you spin around or you spin the airplane kind of like a lasso, or in my case, I physically spun around and got really dizzy, probably not the best way to do it. Um, but you spun around and you got the airplane flying up above you. Now, did, as you're spinning, picture that, even if you didn't do it as a kid, you can, you can picture it, you've seen it done before. Did the distance that you are, the, the kid, from the airplane ever change? No, it didn't change, why not? It's on a string, it can't change. The distance is fixed, however, the altitude is constantly changing. And what changes the altitude? Well, how fast you were spinning. It was all about that ground speed. What happened when you slowed down your spinning? The airplane came lower, the turns got much larger. Was the airplane the same physical distance from you? Yes, it's attached to a string, right? It's the same distance, whether it be vertically, horizontally, it's the same distance from you. You just slowed down. So it, it came down, but it stayed the same distance around you. What happens when you sped up, when you spun around faster, you lassoed, kind of spun your hand faster, what happened? 
As you went faster, the airplane increased in altitude. The turns got much smaller. But here's the question. Did the airplane become further away from you? Well, it's above you now, yes, but it's the same distance, right? Horizontally, vertically, it doesn't matter. The airplane maintains the same distance from you the entire time. That is the essence of eights on pylons. We use a pivotal altitude and we do it based on our ground speed. So you have to know where the wind is coming from. Why do we practice things like eights on pylons? Well, one of the main reasons, and this gets so, so overlooked. In fact, in the knowledge section, I, have the, I printed out the ACS. I didn't want to miss anything. The very first thing, does the applicant demonstrate an understanding of the purpose of eights on pylons? If I asked you right now, I mean, this is straight from the check ride. If I said to you, what's the purpose of eights on pylons? Could you answer that? Give me a real world example of where eights on pylons come into play. Think about it this way. Have you ever been on base, a windy, uh, a windy crosswind day on your base turn of the traffic pattern, and you blew through final, or you rolled out too early on final on a crosswind day? That's, that, that's classic eights on pounds. Someone say, oh, that's wind drift. I, I beg to differ. While there's a wind drift component to it, if you have a tailwind on base, you have increased your ground speed. Now you can say, oh, the wind caused me to do that. Yes, that is true, but the wind causes you to speed up and slow down along with your climbs and descents on eights on pylons as well. It's a little bit of both. And there is a wind drift component to eights on pylons too. You can't ignore the fact the wind's gonna blow your light airplane around. But the main focus is that pivotal altitude. You know where people blow through final is base when they have a tailwind, meaning when you're landing, you have a cross, assuming you're left traffic, you have a, a crossing from the left. Picture this for me. You're on base, you have a tailwind. You have a tailwind, so you're finding yourself, you're a little bit high as well. You're getting pushed through, so you're a little faster. So you find yourself high. So what do you do instinctively? And unfortunately, you push the nose forward, which just increases your speed even more. And now you're banking more steeply because you're going so much faster and you roll right on through final. That's a little wind drift and a little pivotal altitude miscalculation because of ground speed. It's classic eights on pylons. Eights on pylons, another great purpose for it is not just helping the traffic pattern. Another great point of of eights on pylons is that mastery of your aircraft, learning that it's more than just wind drift that affects my aircraft and it's turning radius. Speed affects it, right? The faster I go or the slower I go, it affects the rate and radius of my turn. If you are asked the purpose of eights on pylons, you can give them the real world examples I just gave you. But if I were on my commercial check ride, which I nearly failed, by the way, I've shared that story a bunch with you also. I don't need to get into it. I, you know, knock on wood, I'm never, I'm never, and that's, a, that's glass, but it'll be okay. I've never failed a check ride, but the closest I ever came was my commercial. And if I had to take my commercial over and I was asked the question, what's the purpose of eights on pylons? It's to learn how speed affects the rate and radius of my turn, specifically ground speed. How does ground speed affect the rate and radius of my turn? And we do that through something called pivotal altitude. That's how I'd answer it. Do you understand the aerodynamics associated with eights on pylons to include coordinated and uncoordinated flight? Pivotal altitude and the factors that affect it, right? Ground speed, that simple. But then again, remember, I just spent so much time telling you how these are different than turns around a point. And then our fourth knowledge item is, oh, the effect of wind on your ground track. You see, eights on pylons, while they are unique, while you're making a kind of a weird figure eight, ground track, wind drift and ground track still play a role in here. There is a, there is a turnaround a point component to it. There's also a rectangular course point to it. Just like the example I gave you on base, I can't blame um, 
rate and radius of turn for blowing through bass. There's a little wind component to it as well, like I was telling you. It's a little bit of each. So to give you a fair comparison on eights on pylons versus turns around a point, turns around a point are the foundation to making better eights on pylons. Here's the risk management section from the ACS. Do you, the applicant, um, uh, identify, assess, and mitigate the risks encompassing a failure to divide attention between the airplane control and observation looking outside, collision hazards, aircraft terrain, obstacles, wires, low altitude maneuvering, stall, spin, C-fit, uh, distractions, loss of situational awareness, improper test management, failure to maintain coordinated flight, failure to manage your energy state, pivotal altitude. More on that in a second here. Emergency landing considerations too. You always, gosh, with all ground reference maneuvers, you need to know if something happens. I'm low. And in some of these pivotal altitudes, you'll get down to 600 feet, 680 feet. I'm in a little, in a little slow, 172. Um, you'll get down there. So if something happens, you need to know where you're going. Do you, does the applicant, here's the skills now, the applicant demonstrates the ability to, one, clear the area, determine the approximate pivotal altitude. Oh, that's interesting. It uses the word approximate. See, I, I missed that word back when I was even doing this under PTS. I missed that word. It's approximate. Your DPE, if you calculate a pivotal altitude of 682 feet, they are not gonna be upset if you, if you kiss 650 feet or 700 feet. It's determine the approximate pivotal altitude. And you know what? From the moment you determine pivotal altitude, the morning of your check ride, by the time you get through the paperwork and the oral exam and the pre-flight and you get to the airplane, it's three, four hours later, commercial check rides are long, you're flying four hours later maybe with a lunch, I used to take lunch breaks in between. The winds have changed. Your ground speed has changed. Approximate pivotal altitude. Here's the big thing, skill item number three. Select suitable pylons, suitable points, that will permit straight and level flight between the pylons. This is so overlooked, and it's right here in the ACS. There should be a moment of straight and level flight between the pylons. You should not roll out of one and roll right into the other. Now, they don't determine. They say just, it'll permit straight and level flight between the pylons. Is that five seconds? Is that 10 seconds? It doesn't say but it will allow straight and level flight between the pylons. This isn't like commercial pilot steep turns where you roll out of one and roll right into the other. That's not eights on pylons. You should roll out and do not feel bad if you're flying straight and level for 10 or 15 seconds because the ACS does not give us the details on how long that should be. You should enter the maneuver, it says, in the correct direction and position using the approximate, I'm sorry, using the appropriate altitude and airspeed. Establish the correct bank angle for the conditions not to exceed 40 degrees. Apply smooth and continuous corrections so that the line of sight reference, so the line of sight reference line maintains on the pylon. Is that dipping the wing down? And again, let's go back to where this whole conversation started. You are now the airplane on the string. You are in the airplane on the string. Let's pretend that string and some of you are watching this as a video, and this will be beneficial for you. Others of you listening to this, I'll describe it the best I can. I'm holding up 2-3 Mike Zulu right now, pointing at the wingtip. Um, the model of 2-3 Mike Zulu, I'm not really holding up the airplane for those of you listening. I'm not that strong. Um, attach this, the, this pretend string, attach it to the tip of your wingtip. Or attach it to somewhere on your strut. Right, just behind the pitot tube, down, down, down the strut a little bit, whatever it is. Picture that string. Use the string because what's the question I always ask and probably your CFI always asks too on turns around a point? Are you the same distance? Are, are you creeping in? Are you creeping away from your point? You see, with eights on pylons, you will creep closer to your point. You will creep further away from your point. It'll look like that visually, but you have to picture the airplane on the string. Sometimes I could spin that airplane as a kid so fast, it would be right above me. And picture you're the pilot in that airplane. It looks like you're too close to the point compared to a turn around a point, but for an eight on pylon, you could be exactly just right depending on speed and everything else, you're probably not gonna get that close to your point. But you know what I mean? Don't worry about, about that feeling. This is a big difference between turns around a point and eights on pylons. If you feel like you're creeping in or creeping away, you will. 
but the distance of the string never changes. That's what I need you to remember with all of that. Do you also divide your attention between accurate coordinated airplane control and outside visual references? And lastly, you ready? Maintain pylon position using appropriate pivotal altitude. And here's the kicker. I'm going to underline it for, for everyone's sake. Avoiding slips and skids. What on earth do they mean? You can cheat on eights on pylons, but you won't get away with it because the ACS knows it. The FAA knows it. You can cheat on eights on pylons by slipping or skidding. If you are slipping or skidding, you are not using pivotal altitude. You are using uncoordinated, poorly executed wind drift techniques is what you're actually doing there. You see, if I told you, like I said, the string is attached to the tip of your wing and you are getting ahead of your point or behind your point, well, couldn't you just use some rudder work to put that wing tip back on that point? You could, but that's cheating. Remember, you've got to catch up to your point. If I'm making my turn and my point is not on that wing tip, that string is not in alignment with it, I need to descend and speed up to my point. If my point is dropping behind me, I need to slow down and increase my altitude to get that point to come back. But how people cheat is they try to get fancy with their footwork. If the point is out in front, right, they'll cheat and they'll do a little, see, I want it to be lined up and they're out here. They'll cheat with a little bit of rudder work to try to get that back to line up. If you've never done an eight on pylon, that probably doesn't make much sense. You push the nose forward to your point to get it to catch up to your wingtip. You pull it back like you're trying to slow a horse up, right? Like, you know, like you pull back on a horse, says the guy who's ridden a horse once in his life. Um, <laughs> another story for another day. Slow the airplane up to allow it, your point to come back to you. Here's your homework. I think, I don't care how old you are, you need to go buy an airplane on a string. I think that's the most important thing right now. And you know what, if you have kids, it's easier to justify it. If you, if you don't have kids, um, if you're like, you know, Coach Ray and you have six dogs as your kids instead, just Coach Ray, tell Pam you bought it for the dogs. You bought it. That's why. Tom, too. Tom, you, Tom edits our, just the audio of this podcast. Tom, Tom's kids are all grown. Tom, you, you bought it to um, entertain the farm. I, I don't know what you guys are going to say, but those of you without kids, you'll have a harder time justifying it. But I recommend going on Amazon and buying an airplane. What's that actually called? An airplane on a string. What is the, can someone leave me a comment below? There's probably a real term for it, not the airplane on a string. I've been calling it that for years. There's, there's a technical term for the airplane on a string. Somebody put it in the comments so I will further, uh, further my knowledge base on that one. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this. Sorry to go long. I try to keep these podcasts like under 10 minutes, under 15 minutes at a max, but I love this topic. Uh, I also had a lot of coffee too, so that helps. Hey, will you try out the online ground school? M0ATrial.com. You're going to love it. Written test prep, check ride prep making that safe real world pilot. You are at a level where you're training to be a commercial pilot now. Mastery is the only option. I'm, I'm sorry, mastery is the only option. You're training to be a true professional. That's how I look at it. Hey, have a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you.